Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys about global warming and like clockwork, every time I give a global warming talk, I wake up and it's snowing outside, which is always perfect. <laughs> but that's actually good because what I want to do is not talk about the short term, not talk about kind of the small scale. I want to talk big picture, longer term, global climate change, the bigger picture stuff that's I think a lot clearer. Um, and where the world is heading with what we're doing quickly supercharging the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. So you probably heard that the science of climate change is settled. Um, and that's true in the sense that we know climate's changing, we're the biggest thing doing that, and it's gonna continue changing. But all the details, all the thousands of ways it's gonna ripple throughout the whole Earth system and rewire the planet is, is tough business to sort out. Um, so I'm a geologist, an Earth historian. I look at big past climate changes because if we can understand those and how they uh, manifested and rolled themselves out, we can get a little bit more insight, hopefully, into where we're going. So I wanna talk the long view, but to start, here is the short view, the more typical one we talk about. You'll see a lot of articles like this the next month. 2016 is going to go down as the hottest year in recorded history, uh, more than a degree Celsius above where we used to be. But that said, how big is one degree Celsius? How weird? How significant is this? And where does this go? And I think taking a perspective of a few decades isn't quite enough to see the scale of the changes that we're unleashing here. Uh, and the reason for that is because this is how you should think of the climate system, like a huge, huge ship out on the ocean. And once this thing is moving, it is moving. And it's got bad breaks. You're not just going to hit it and stop on a dime. It's going for a while. And it's going for a while because we have huge oceans that have been taking up a lot of the heat to date. So we've got plenty of warming to catch up on. Plenty of our CO2 is going to be up in the sky for thousands of years, which means the heat's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and that means we have a lot of the ice on the planet's going to be melting for thousands of years. So goodbye stable shoreline. Sea level is just going to be going and going and going. And to revamp global energy infrastructure, right, that's a decades and decades long project in and of itself, which means there's a lot more carbon that's going to be emitted in the interim. So you put all this together, and the bottom line is there is a lot of momentum building up behind the ship here. And there's already a lot more climate change baked in than it looks like just staring outside today in one snowy day in one spot in the world, right? So the bottom line is most geologists, earth scientists, will tell you that this, with all this momentum here, this is absolutely geological in scale. This is huge. This is like the end of the Cretaceous, the dinosaurs staring up at the sky and seeing a whole new era of earth history getting ushered in. And geologists have termed this new epoch of Earth history we're walking into the Anthropocene, meaning it's about us, it's people. We're the biggest thing driving global change. And that's true in a ton of ways, but climate's maybe, maybe the best example of this. Uh, and with that in mind, I think a really useful way to think about this is from the geological perspective, because it's that big. You've got to look at more than just sort of one article about 2016 to sort of get a sense for what's going on here. So fortunately, we have great records of long-term climate history. One of the best is an ice core through the Antarctic ice sheet, and we can look at old layers of snowfall here and see what temperature in Antarctica has done going back for 800,000 years. And what you're seeing is the rise and fall of the last eight ice ages. So these are the last big climate changes in Earth history, and maybe one of our best windows into the future. So in the 1970s, we got a good clue into what's driving ice ages. And the way we figured it out is scientists realized that these are not random wiggles. These are really clear cycles and rhythms going on. And these cycles match up spot on with a few well-known cycles in the Earth's orbit around the sun, uh, where the orbit is sort of tilting more this way, stretching this way. So somehow these little orbital wiggles and wobbles are triggering ice ages. But what was just as clear in the 1970s when this was discovered is that these two pieces can't be the whole puzzle. There's got to be more going on. And the reason's simple, which is that if you tilt the Earth a little this way, that way, you get some more sunlight here, but you get some less sunlight there. And across the world, there is no change on average. And yet, we get big global ice ages, the whole world moving in and out. So there's got to be more going on. So we need something that can explain global climate changes the world over. And an obvious thing you might consider right, is carbon dioxide. So you can look at little air bubbles in this ice core to figure out what CO2 was doing over this whole time window. And scientists were stunned when we first pulled up these ice cores and realized it is rising and falling in lockstep with the ice ages. Right, so you look at this for about a second and you start wondering, is carbon what's driving something as big as ice ages? And if that's the case, then that's a real wake-up call because here's where we are today, right? Way up high and quickly shooting through the ceiling. 
plenty of people have made this point, politicians, scientists, and said, look, there's proof in the pudding. Look at that ice core. It shows you CO2 is some potent, potent stuff. Plenty of other people, though, have said that's completely backwards. CO2 isn't causing ice ages. CO2 is more of an effect of ice ages. And say, if you look in detail, you find that temperatures rise first, and then CO2 changes later. There's more important things going on in the world. We're, we're obsessed with carbon. It's not that big of a deal. So I'm going to zoom into the end of the last ice age, because that's where we think we've really kind of got uh, this puzzle sort of all put together. And I want to walk you through the story of what we think was going on to transform the world out of the ice age. So here we are 20,000 years ago. It's a cold, icy world. By 10,000 years ago, we've warmed up. Um, and if you look in detail, what you notice is that temperature in Antarctica looks like it did start warming a little bit before CO2. But we did a study a couple years ago to make the point that temperature in any one spot in the world, like Antarctica, is just temperature in one spot in the world. Right? And we know what temperature was doing all across the world as the last ice age was ended, uh, ending from paleoclimate records. So we pulled all that data together. And shock of shocks, different places are doing different things. Right? You've got to keep your eye on the prize, look at the big picture patterns to make sense of it. But if you average all these paleoclimate records, here's what global temperature was doing. And it rose right along with the rise in carbon dioxide and, importantly, just after the carbon dioxide. We saw this evidence that it looks pretty clear like CO2 is the biggest thing driving up the global temperature. So this is kind of a key piece in the puzzle here. CO2 is the biggest, the biggest dial here cranking up the global thermostat. Okay? But then you might look at this and say, well, there's got to be more going on, because you just said Antarctica was already warming up. Parts of the world were already warming up before CO2 took off. So there's got to be more. So we looked at that, split the world in two, and said, what's going on with the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere as we're exiting the ice age? And they're doing different things. So there's just subtracting those two curves. That's the difference in temperature between the hemispheres. So why is that changing through time? Well, the key piece of the climate system is this big conveyor belt of ocean circulation in the Atlantic. And it's constantly moving warm water across the equator. We're basically stealing heat from the southern hemisphere, bringing it up here to us in the north, warming us up. And that water gets cold and dense. It sinks in the deep ocean, and it goes back to the south Antarctica. So we're constantly stealing heat from the south, bringing it up here. But if you were to turn this thing off, well, then we're going to keep the heat bottled up in the south. And we know how this conveyor belt was changing as the last ice age ended from geologic records on the seafloor. And it's a spot on match. So it seems like, yeah, this is a key thing going on. 19,000 years ago, this conveyor belt shut down, and it bottled all the heat up in the south. Okay? So another important piece, this conveyor belt of ocean circulation, but as is often the case with Climate change, that just kicks the question one step further, because then why did the ocean circulation turn off? So this got us looking up to the north, where we had huge ice sheets during the Ice Age. Boston was under a mile of ice. Uh, and we pulled together thousands of dates that geologists made trying to figure out when these ice sheets were at their biggest extent. And it turns out the different corners of all these big ice sheets started to melt back right about 19,000 years ago, right when this conveyor belt turned off. And the reasoning here is that when this ice melts, it starts flooding the Atlantic Ocean with a lot of fresh water. And fresh water is really light and buoyant, and it can't sink. So that conveyor belt's driving along, trying to turn over and sink down, but you put a bunch of fresh water here that's really buoyant, and it jams the whole thing up, and it can't sink, so it turns off. Okay, so melting ice sheets turns off the conveyor. So we think that's another key piece here. Which then leads you back to one more question, right? Which is, well, then why were ice sheets melting? And this one's actually not so tough, because 20,000 years ago, the Earth was just tilting a little more, one of these orbital wobbles. And so we're getting more sunlight hitting down on Canada and Europe, which started melting these ice sheets. So we think this is sort of the bottom line. All these pieces here are how the whole system is put together, how we drive the world out of an ice age, OK? Big sort of puzzle pieces. So to kind of walk you through it and, and forward here, I, th I find this kind of a crazy story or insight into how the climate works. 20,000 years ago, basically, a flick of extra sunlight hits Canada, starts melting ice, fresh water goes gushing into the ocean, jams up this conveyor belt, turns it off, stores heat down south. That causes changes down there, which gets CO2 gassing out of the ocean, which then goes on to warm up the whole world, keeps melting ice, et cetera, et cetera. The thing spirals on itself until before you know it, we're up and out of the ice age, completely transform the world from this flick of sunlight at the beginning. 
So when you look at it this way, this is how I see the climate system. If you ever played Mousetrap, right? It's full of tripwires, interconnections going on, lots of pieces bouncing off of each other. So we're talking about the Ice Age, and you might say, what is this? Who, who cares? What does this have to do with anything? The key piece, right, is it's the same world, the same climate system, the same physics apply today. We're not nodding a little bit on the axis of the Earth. We're raising CO2, but the same rules of the game apply, right? A lot of the same connections are going to be at play here. So again, mapping out how this is going to ripple across the world will be challenging and we'll need more science, but I think something like an ice age gives us some insight into the sort of things to expect here. So to get this together into the big long picture view, here's global temperature as the ice age ended. A few degrees of warming until 10,000 years ago. But this then got us thinking about, well, where are we today? Can we put today in kind of context? And so we pulled together a lot more paleoclimate records and we averaged them and said, here's global average temperature for 10,000 years. And it's basically done nothing. Boring, smooth ride throughout all of human civilization. Until you get to the last century, right? And now in 2016, we're more than a degree Celsius up from where we used to be. So that's big. That means we're probably warmer now than we've been through the whole interval of, of civilization, right? And where are we going? Well, we know we're going. We're going up. And maybe we're going up a little bit more. Maybe we're going up many, many degrees more, depending on how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. But in either case, that's big, right? Because the end of an ice age is a few degrees. So we're talking a few degrees, but in a century or two. And in either case, CO2 is such a long lifetime in the atmosphere that this is not going away anytime soon. This stretches out for millennia, which is big. That means you're living at a remarkable moment in time where the next several decades, we bend that curve one way or the other, and the changes just echo out for millennia, right? Phenomenal, phenomenal implications. So that's what the science tells us. But if you just go find a random person on the street and ask them what their sort of mental model is of all this, and people have done this, it turns out people far overestimate how much warming occurred at the end of the Ice Age. I think it was 15 degrees or more. And they think over the last several thousand years, there's been all sorts of bumps and wiggle, very variable climate. And most people think that the carbon will come out of the atmosphere in a matter of decades. So as soon as we stop burning fossil fuels, well, it'll come down and things will cool back off. This is a very different picture, right? Clearly, most people, it, their long view in their mind is, is very, very different. There's a huge disconnect going on between what the science tells us uh, and what people, most people understand about this. So the bottom line is, the long view, I think, tells us that this stretch is far out, and there are really big changes that are locked in here that we're going to see unfold, not just for decades, but way, way into the future, right? And this opens up tons of questions, tons of questions for scientists, social scientists, uh, the humanities, everybody, like Tom was saying at the beginning. And the bottom line I would say is I think we need everybody to come at this because there are so many big questions here and everybody kind of has a different piece to chip in uh, to answering all this stuff, right? So big, bold, kind of brave new world we're heading into. And we're all going down this big road together. So if you haven't heard it yet, I would say to you is welcome to the Anthropocene. Thanks. Uh, so as we just heard, and as most of you probably know, climate change is real, and if we don't act, the consequences could be very severe for humanity. Uh, and while you should be rightly scared of that, the good news is that we actually know what we have to do, and we know what the options are to avoid the worst climate outcomes. So as Jeremy just very clearly showed us, we know what's causing temperature change is uh, primarily human uh, emissions of carbon dioxide, and this is primarily coming from our consumption of fossil fuels for energy. So what this means is that to avoid the worst climate outcomes, in the short run, we need to start replacing uh, our fossil fuel energy with more renewable, non-emitting energy sources. And since we're not going to be able to replace all fossil fuels uh, in, in the short run, we're still going to be using fossil, fossil fuels for the next few decades, uh, it's very important that we start using that energy much more efficiently. So by driving more efficient cars and using more efficient appliances. Okay, so the good news is uh, we know what we have to do, and what I want to talk to you today about is how we should go about achieving those goals, how we should go about encouraging uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So economists would prefer that we address our climate challenges by placing a tax or a cap on carbon emissions. And the idea here is if we take that one simple step and make it costly for people to pollute, the market will respond with the appropriate amount of these measures, right? The market will give us uh, the right amount of renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency to meet our policy objectives. Now, while I, as an economist, feel pretty strongly that this would help us achieve our policy goals at the lowest possible social cost, 
uh, for a number of reasons, policymakers, particularly those in the United States, instead of penalizing pollution, they prefer to actually promote these measures directly, right? So rather than placing a price on carbon dioxide emissions, instead policymakers would like to prop up these sub substitutes with policies that are going to encourage renewable energy or energy efficiency. So why does this matter? It's because once we go this more prescriptive route, there are actually a lot of different steps we can take to achieve these goals, right? There are many different ways we can encourage renewable energy. And from an economics perspective, what I want to talk to you about is that not all of these ways are the same, right? Some ways are better than others uh, to achieve these goals. So I'm going to talk to you about two research papers of mine trying to shed some light on this, uh, empirically looking at wind energy in the United States and energy efficient appliances. Okay, so as many of you probably know, wind energy in the United States has actually been increasing very rapidly. And uh, wind power is promoted by very generous federal subsidies. So the way these policies worked historically uh, was primarily through an output-based subsidy. So the way this works is uh, if you're a wind farm developer, you spend a bunch of money up front to set up a wind farm. You need to buy turbines, buy land. It involves big cranes. Uh, and once this wind farm is up and running, uh, the federal government pays you uh, $23 for every megawatt hour you send to the grid. Right? So every time this wind turbine spins, we give you an additional subsidy in, uh, on top of the electricity price. As part of the 2009 stimulus package, the Obama administration introduced a new type of uh, subsidy targeting wind investment rather than output. So this is something known as the 1603 grant program, and the way this worked was that Rather than having uh, investors bear the full cost of setting up a wind farm, the federal government would give you a check equal to 30% of the costs you incurred setting up this big wind farm like this. Right? So investors uh, set up a wind farm, federal government pays for 30% of the costs, and then once you start running, you're on your own. You don't get this output-based subsidy anymore. And so what we're going to ask in this paper uh, with some of my colleagues, uh, Joe Aldi and Todd Gerardin at Harvard, uh, is which approach is better, right? Both of these policies are targeting wind uh, output, and we want to know which is better from a public economics perspective. So the important thing to know here is that the goal of this policy is related to wind output. Okay, so we've got some coal plant off in the distance, and every time this coal plant operates, it, it emits carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and what we want to do is try to replace some of that output from this coal plant with some output from these wind farms here, from these wind turbines. So uh, anyone who's ever driven by a wind turbine and seen it idle knows that having a wind turbine installed is not the same as that thing actually generating power and sending it to the grid. Uh, and so the point here is that as, from a policy perspective, we care about wind output, not wind capital. And we think that there are a lot of measures developers can take when setting up a wind farm, which will actually increase output if properly incentivized. They can put their turbines in windier locations, and they can operate them more efficiently once they're up and running. So in this paper, as I mentioned, what we're going to try to do is empirically say how much did this matter uh, in the stimulus package. So what we did was we co collected wind uh, output for every wind farm in the United States. And we also worked with Treasury to identify which sub subsidy regime each wind farm had. And using two different empirical strategies where we use some fancy econometrics to try to get a causal estimate of the impact of the subsidy distinction, we find that wind farms that receive an output-based subsidy are 9 to 10 percent more uh, productive than wind farms that receive an investment subsidy. So what does this mean? It means that under the stimulus package, the United States paid about 20 percent more per unit of wind renewable energy for the same amount of wind. Okay? To give you an idea of how, much this, how big this is in dollar terms, the recent extension of these wind subsidies was scored by the Congressional Budget Office at about $5 billion. So wasting 20% of that is about a billion dollars of taxpayer money. Right? So this is real money. Turning to the second paper, uh, policymakers in the United States also have many different options for encouraging energy efficiency. Okay? So there's a widespread uh, policy belief that people are underinvesting in energy saving technology. So what do I mean by that? I mean that engineers tell us that if people would just spend a little bit more money up front to buy a more efficient vehicle or a more efficient car, that investment would more than pay for itself over the lifetime of this capital in lower energy expenses. So the fact that this uh, belief is so widespread that everyone seems to believe that people are making this mistake means that we actually have a lot of different policy in the United States right now encouraging energy efficiency at both the state and federal level. 
Some of these policies just try to reduce the difference in upfront cost through generous uh, taxpayer-funded subsidies for buying a more efficient appliance. And other policies instead try to nudge consumers uh, by providing them with additional information. So if you've ever shopped for an appliance and seen one of these yellow tags here telling you the energy expenses associated with any uh, individual appliance, the idea behind making people display these tags is that what really explains the energy efficiency gap is that people just don't have the right information. If they knew how much they would save from energy efficiency, they would make different choices. Okay, so what I wanted to do in this paper with, um, with Hunt Alcott is try to investigate this further to see which policy is better by focusing on the U.S. water heater market. So water heating is the second largest uh, home energy consumption category in the United States. And in addition to being important in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, it's a nice setting to study the energy paradox because it's so boring. All right, so water heaters are this thing that sits in your basement and you never think about it until once every eight to 10 years, it breaks, you have water all over your basement and you can't take a hot shower, right? And having never thought about water heaters for a decade, you are suddenly in the market for a water heater, right? Probably having not thought very much about it at all. In addition to being something you haven't really prepared for, uh, it's also a situation where it looks like the energy paradox exists. It costs about four or five hundred dollars more. Uh, sorry, it costs about four or five hundred dollars to buy a water heater, and to get the more energy efficient model, you have to spend an additional two hundred and fifty bucks up front. So that, in addition to the fact that this is probably not a planned expenditure, I mean, this is real money for people. Nevertheless, should you actually make that decision to invest in this efficient model, we think it'll give you about a 15% return over the next 10 years that you're using this water heater. Okay, so that's not earth shattering, uh, but this is about three times the return on equities in the United States. So to the extent that we think people have money in the stock market, this is at least a better investment than that. Nevertheless, when we look at this data, we see only one out of every 30 customers actually make this choice. Right, so what we wanted to do in this paper was figure out what we could do to in increase that ratio. So to test this, uh, building, you know, related to some of the stuff that uh, Nathaniel told us about, we ran a large field experiment. So we partnered with a major U.S. retailer of appliances, and it turns out that this retailer sells a third of all their water heaters through a single call center in Iowa. So the nice thing about a call center is it makes it very easy to run, to run a randomized control trial. So people's water heater breaks one morning, they call into this call center, and we were able to randomly allocate callers into different treatment arms. Some callers, we just offered them 25 or 100 bucks off the energy efficient model. And other callers, we had the sales agent read them a very carefully crafted script, clearly explaining how much money they would save over the next decade should they buy the more efficient water heater. And then in the final treatment, which was novel for the literature, uh, on some randomly selected calls, we offered sales agents a $25 bonus if they were able to sell an efficient water heater on this call. So these are people mainly with a high school education outside of Des Moines, and they make about $9 an hour, so this was a pretty good incentive on the margin to encourage them to try to sell this. And our main finding in this paper was actually a surprising one. So I think I set you guys up by telling you this was a setting, you know, we picked, we sort of cherry picked this setting because we really thought people were making a mistake. We thought people don't think about their water heaters and it looks like the savings are large. Nevertheless, when we read people this very carefully crafted informational script, which is about as, uh, you know, as, as strong uh, information treatment as you can imagine, uh, we don't find any change in people's behavior. Right? So we estimate a statistical zero, meaning that uh, this is a very precise estimate. Right? So we can bound this as having no larger than a 2% effect on, on take up. Um, so what's going on here? We were somewhat puzzled by this. Uh, so we did some follow-up surveys to try to unpack these results further. And what we found is that, for sure, people are very confused about energy efficiency. So actually, I, should mention, given that Nathaniel mentioned people sort of lying in surveys, one thing we know is we know exactly what water heater people bought. Um, and then we asked them, you know, which water heater did you buy, just to sort of check, uh, when we did this follow-up survey. And even though only 3% of people had bought an efficient water heater, about half said they had, right? <laughs> so some, there's general confusion about energy efficiency. Nevertheless, what was interesting is that we found that people were not biased against the energy efficient model, meaning we asked them how much they thought they would save from energy efficiency if they bought the efficient model, and most people actually overstated the benefits. Right? So people are confused, but not necessarily biased against it. We also asked them why, it, why you didn't purchase if you uh, said that you didn't, and only 30% of people said it was because the price was too high. 
Right, so there's a bunch of other stuff going on here. Common answers were that they had a very tight space and they couldn't fit the efficient one, or that uh, it was out of stock and uh, not surprisingly, these people wanted hot water as soon as possible. Uh, and the, returning to this third treatment arm that I mentioned, uh, one of the interesting things we found is that when we interacted customer inf uh, incentives with sales agent incentives to sell the efficient model, we found an enormous increase in take up, right? So the, point uh, so the market share increased by 20%. And so we couple, when we take this finding, couple with what we found in our surveys, which is people have very nuanced reasons for not, uh, not purchasing the efficient model, we take this as evidence that a one-size-fits-all policy, just sort of giving everyone the same information, is probably not going to be very effective in this setting. Uh, but providing the supply uh, side of this market additional incentives to promote energy efficiency could be a nice alternative. Right now, all of our policy is focused on consumers. Okay, so to wrap up, the point of telling you about these two papers and the point I want to leave you guys with today is that not all energy, or not all green policies are the same, right? So it's not enough to simply know we need to do more renewable energy or we need to do more energy efficiency. It really matters how we design these policies. Okay, so sometimes we have a good idea about how to design these policies from theory, uh, as in the wind example, and other times it's gonna be really important to test these uh, policies in the field, like the water heater example. Uh, nevertheless, you know, despite um, there's obviously still some political opposition and pe people uh, who are not uh, fully on board with the science and acknowledging climate change exists, but I think actually on average most voters acknowledge that climate change is happening and the real uh, argument we're having uh, is whether or not it's too costly to do something about it, right? So climate change is real, but it might be too expensive to sort of turn the ship around that Jeremy showed us. Uh, and in that environment, it's going to be very important that we design our policies such that we get the biggest bang, bang for the buck and, uh, and we're designing these as effective as possible. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to take a slightly different um, approach uh, to talking about a problem that affects, that is central to environment and society that we're examining this afternoon. And, uh, I will illustrate the challenges of powering the lives of approximately three billion who are energy poor around the world. And I'll do this by portraying the lives of about 160 million households in India that today are power starved. I think to do anything about this problem, we have to understand and grasp the full measure of the complexities like Tom Childs was talking about. And we have to even think of, and this is how I'm going to end my presentation, is how universities generate knowledge that matters for this population and for translation of this knowledge into real world impacts. And I think that's really uh, what I'm going to focus my talk on. So let's just uh, quickly take a uh, look at some of the basic facts. If you, when it comes to India, 65% of the population is rural. So out of 1.25 billion people, you have about 812 million or so that live in rural areas, and many are barely on the grid, if at all. Now, if you dig further, of the rural households, only 55% have any electricity a light bulb in the primary health care clinic or a village school uh, and at best a few homes. And that's called an electrified you know, village. Now, in 2012 in India, something interesting happened. There was a massive power outage. Almost 550 million people didn't have any power. There was a series of cascading problems and a lot of people were just taken out into the dark. Now, what about the remaining 650 million in India? If you think about it, it did not matter because their lives did not change that day. What changed was the rest of India that had power joined them in the dark. This is the scale of the problem we're dealing with. If you really want to have large scale societal and environmental outcomes, you have to understand the fundamental problem of the the poor that are in the dark. Now, when you dig down a little deeper, what you find is that there are, off the rural air, you know, population, 
about 92.8 million households are electrified, that do barely, and 75 million households are unelectrified. That's almost 300 million people without electricity. Now, in this population, what's very interesting is 189 million students live in rural areas in India, and they're enrolled in classes 1 through 12, and they go to school. They have to study. How do you do that under conditions like this? It has real significant impacts, not just on today, but generation after generation. Now, out of these 189 million students, 81.2 million of them use kerosene for their basic lighting, because that's the only thing that they have access to, to study at night. Otherwise, the options are very, very few. And kerosene has its own implications. And if you look at this uh, chart, more than 80% of rural households use traditional fuels. And here, think of the energy poor, those we want to power, as having insecurity on two fronts. Right? One is they are unable to mechanize, do small uh, agricultural processing, or anything that is productive in scale to earn a living using uh, any access to power. And the other problem without having, if you don't have energy and power, is you unable to engage in fundamental aspects of cooking and ensuring that clean fuels are available uh, for your daily cooking and also lighting. And if you look on, the, uh, on this chart, most people are really relying on very rudimentary fuels, such as fuel and dung cakes, and that is in 2016 for cooking and lighting. And kerosene, as I just mentioned, as primary lighting fuel. And what does kerosene do? I mean, approximately we know, and, and the, this is a very wide variation, um, but worldwide the estimates are that four to 25 billion liters of kerosene are used for lighting across the world. And imagine what that does, 270,000 um, tons of black carbon is put out into the atmosphere. But kerosene also is very bad because very fine particulate matter uh, that's emitted when you burn kerosene can actually cross the blood organ barrier. And that means it has not only the social consequences and environmental consequences we we're talking about, but severe health consequences. Now, I want to start telling you the story of those who are power starved. Now, they're not just waiting for us to do some good. They're going about their lives given the choices they have. These are women and children very proud. They go about their business. They're focused. They have to do a job. Without this daily hunt for the fuel that you're seeing by millions of such women and children, there will be no fires in the hearth or heat for the millions. They're powering their lives the best way they know, the way it works for them, the way their societies and households expect them to do. Now, every day, this hunt for fuel is very interesting. It, it has enormous consequences. It has consequences for women's bodies. It has impacts on the ecosystems. It has impacts on social and health outcomes. And let me just give you a, a very quick sense of how this hunt for fuel sounds like, looks like, Take you deep into a forest in Orissa in India, uh, a forest near in a place called Satkosia. And I hope the sound is working here. This is just children also bearing this burden. 
What you're hearing is all the ambient noise in the middle of the forest and women like this every day for several hours hacking away to generate the fuel needed for that week, for that day. So that's how, you know, millions and millions of women and children are engaged in the hunt for fuel. Women come tumbling out of forests, carrying wood, sometimes carrying wood while caring for children. But it is certain what you see here, more than anything, is the weight of social norms that women must bear because they're power starved, because their families are energy insecure. So those are the kind of social burdens that we have to understand that when we talk about environment and society, it's just not a throwaway line. These are real consequential outcomes where environment and society are very tightly coupled. And then they come home, and these strong women, what they have to do is cook meals. Sometimes like this woman who is seven months pregnant, two hours in the morning, and another two hours in the evening cooking out of very rudimentary fires like this. Now, these fires are bad for the climate, and we have seen some very good presentations on these. And these are, you know, these amplify some of these processes. Some of them might be natural, but these anthropogenic forces amplify these uh, climate dimensions that we've heard of uh, so nicely this morning. Now, the other outcome of this kind of behavior because of lack of choices and options is loss of life or loss of productive life. And generally that is measured as disability adjusted life years, which is an aggregate measure of years of loss of healthy life in a country. And if you look at those data in South Asia alone, disability adjusted life years attributable to household air pollution are staggering 41 million lives. Now, when you think about the context for powering the poor, you have to also understand the alternatives these women have and what alternatives do they have but to support, at times, families that are very large. In fact, some of this, this work that I do, you confront families that are extended families with 30 people in a household. You almost need that because you are knitting together all kinds of livelihoods that young, old, middle-aged are doing in that household to support that household. You need those kinds of numbers. And so what are the options but to essentially take these fragile lives, which are like a, a quilt constantly being repaired and tenuously held together through these very you know, fragile livelihoods. Sometimes agriculture, when agriculture fails, uh, circular wage labor where you migrate to the closest town. If that fails, taking loan and then going into tomato farming and then trying to hit the jackpot. So this is the fragility and the risk that is ubiquitous in these lives that we want to intervene with renewables, with solar, with better clean fuels and technologies. And that's the challenge when we want to affect these vast numbers in our societies that are energy insecure. And here we have to understand how the powerless also cause their own ripple effects. Now here what you see is people tending for days on, three, four, five days, making charcoal. Right? Now that has its own effects on people, but they're producing it for peri-urban, urban areas because that's, where, that's what the poor prefer as their primary fuel. So it has all these secondary ripple impacts on people's lives in rural areas where they're trying to make a living supplying very unclean fuels to the urban areas. So the case I'm making here is that we have to understand these very complex set of feedback mechanisms that are implicated in affecting um, the lives of the poor and giving them more power cleaner power, cleaner fuels. And yet, what you find in the midst are 
innovations like this guy. Aspirational, you find adaptation here in a totally dark village, not electrified in a Gogunda district of Rajasthan in Western India, you find you confront two solar panels on, on the top of a hut. This person just charging his cell phone every day because he needs it for connecting with daily wage labor contractors. That's his only way out of a very insecure agricultural livelihood that he has. So his daily wages are dependent on this precious phone and the panels he's invested in on his own. Or you'll find women like this on river islands in Brahmaputra River adopting liquefied petroleum gas, a clean fuel. But that's innovation. That's, you see women taking on fuels like this. The question is, if women and, and men in remote areas are doing this, then what can we learn from their behavior and then replicate to power the poor? Or in a remote western uh, part of Gujarat in, in India called Kutch, where women like this, and this, this woman is, a, is legendary in this part of the world, her name is Hansabai. She single-handedly ran for a local office, and then when she did get the position, brought solar energy to pump water from a well like this, three, four, five kilometers to her village, to every one of those households, 30, 40 households. That's going against the tide, against very tough conditions, but leveraging resources you have, which is enormous amount of sun. So the point I'm making here is we have to engage with these populations if you want to power the poor, but understand their complexity. And that's what I want to turn to very, very quickly for the next couple minutes and then end my talk. We have to think about this transdisciplinary that is crossing disciplines or engaging in collaboration in deep ways with other disciplines for the kind of impact we want to bring in the world. So if you think about this, a problem like this where energy, environment, and, you know, and air issues are tightly coupled with food and water security, with health, and with sustainable livelihoods. So now the question is, how do we affect this? In universities, and think of these as phases of research, right? In phase one, in time one, uh, the fundamental work we do in universities where we make discoveries, such as something, uh, some sensor or some um, material can actually do environmental reclamation really beautifully. Some chemical that we can use to clean up water. But then the question is, in the second phase of our research, we test that, we pilot it, we do all of that very well in universities. But the challenge of powering the poor is to really go to the next phase of our research, which is how do we take that small piloted intervention that we know works in limited conditions, under limited conditions, and really enable in the real world conditions for such technologies to work, take hold, and take root. Once we know under real world challenges, it actually works. Whatever intervention, intervention or social innovation, whatever it is that we've designed, then the challenge is how do we scale it up for the millions and billions? This is what we need if you if need to power the poor. It's not just good enough to say we have off the shelf solar powered systems. What we have to do is really go from the fundamental discoveries and initial piloting all the way out into the practice world where the real innovations and interventions have to take hold to change and transform lives. And that's the education that I think at BC we have to think seriously and a research day like this should, is quite inspirational for me but it's also a call to think very deeply about how do we innovate in the academy. Even if we know that there's a lot of solar resource power in India, the question we're left with is, how do you actually change the ecosystem to full scale solar power so that people don't have to depend on unclean fuels, but can leapfrog to induction stoves, can leapfrog 
to the next generation. They don't have to go in some sequence, a linear way, from very old technologies to intermediate to better. That's our challenge. And in that, let me suggest to you that really embedding our work, taking our technologies and embedding them in communities, working with communities, and engaging and leveraging the knowledge of communities so that we adapt these technologies so they can sustain under real world conditions is our real challenge. And only in doing so that we not only educate our students at BC in this new way of thinking, that is, just discovery is not good enough, but really looking at how innovations take root and transform lives will enable girls like this to transform their own lives. Thank you. My name's Connor Very Valentius. Last Labor Day, I went on a little vacation. Stopped by South Station and was stopped in my tracks by this announcement. Earthquake, magnitude uh, upgraded actually to 5.8 in a little town called Pawnee, Oklahoma. How many of y'all also heard about this? Yeah. What was going to be a no electronics camping trip turned out to be a quite frantically uh, electronic checking train ride on the Down Easter. If you were aware of any kind of media in North America, over the last couple of years, you're probably aware of a dramatic upsurge in seismicity in the middle of the continent. Whether you're checking mainstream news sources or cheesy uh, celeb-watching websites, earthquakes have been part of the news about usually seismically quiescent parts of the world. These earthquakes in Texas, in Oklahoma, in Ohio, in Kansas, and Arkansas are part of what the US Geological Survey has identified as a major uptick in two different things that are important for us. One is the number of earthquakes, which since 2009 has dramatically increased. We're talking orders of magnitude. You can see that in the red. The other thing you can see here is the geography of these earthquakes. That is, pre-2009, earthquakes of moment magnitude three or more, that is, earthquakes you could probably feel, not necessarily feel very powerfully, but probably feel, they occur in the blue dots on some places that we know to be fault lines, but a lot of them are sort of scattered about, which is what you'd expect in places that don't experience a whole lot of earthquakes. The red dots indicate since 2009, where, as you can see, they're dramatically clustered. Now, this is important because very few people move to Oklahoma expecting it to be earthquake country. And this is important because when earthquakes occur in places do, that people do not expect, we're not prepared for them, and we are much more at risk. I went to school in California. I returned home to, a long time ago, uh, I went, returned home to Arkansas, and I would walk into big box stores and start cringing because there would be, you know, refrigerator, not refrigerators, there would be dishwashers stacked on high pallets, right? Restaurants would have all kinds of beautiful glassware up high on a single hook, right? Which you'd never have in California. So, whether it's something as small as do you know how to turn off the gas in your home or something as structural as what are the engineering codes that govern what your walls are made of and how much they move, places that expect earthquakes are places where people tend to be able to walk unharmed out of buildings after earthquakes. The buildings may not be usable after that, but the people will be okay. The other reason that the earthquakes in mid-continent are important have to do with some of where they're happening. So this earthquake it hit, it, a couple weeks ago hit Cushing, Oklahoma. Not a big place population-wise, but an enormously important place because it's the nexus of a set of pipelines that cross the country. It's also the so-called tank farm. That is the place where about 557 and a half million gallons of oil sit waiting for us to use it. Seismic disturbance to Cushing, Oklahoma is therefore a very big deal. Did you hear of this quake? This quake took place November 7th, which took place, which is immediately before November 8th. Most of us were paying attention to very different things at that moment. Mid-continent quakes matter. They're even making the USGS change the way we understand and talk about the danger of future quakes. So rather than using multi-year, indeed multi-decade estimates, USGS has begun to put out one-year earthquake forecasts. The left-hand chunk 
of this diagram shows what I certainly would expect and what I imagine most of you all would expect. That is, if you live in many parts of the western US, you need to be prepared for earthquakes. Have shoes under your bed, right? Have an emergency plan, know where your family's gonna meet, right? Duck cover and hold on. The right hand side would have been very surprising to most of us 10 years ago and even five. It's becoming more familiar now. And that is, you can see an oblong along the Mississippi River, that's the New Madrid quake zone, and then dots around Dallas in Arkansas on that border between uh, Colorado and New Mexico, and then spanning out from Oklahoma. The other thing that's new about this is this distinction here between natural, that is, that the, the human beings haven't done anything about, and so-called induced earthquake. Induced parallel with, named in, uh, in analogy with induced labor. So somebody who's not pregnant takes Pitocin, nothing much happens. Someone who is close to a due date takes Pitocin, let me tell you, quite a lot happens very rapidly. In the same way, earthquakes that are induced near a fault that is close to a sticking point, right, a lot can happen. All right, what's the, what are the words on the tip of your tongue right now? What do you expect me to talk about next? Yes. So the fact that an entire group of people would have one accord say this indicates something really interesting to me, which is the creation of new knowledge. Because if I had stood up here and said, Oklahoma will experience earthquakes and it's because of energy development in, say, the year 2000, I certainly would not get a job at a really high-ranking research university like this one, right? That would be Cooksville. So this is new knowledge to a very large extent. Although, as I'm finding out, there were a lot of reasons why we should have expected this, and a lot of evidence in the literature that we should, it shouldn't have been as much of a surprise. The fact that energy development, hydraulic fracturing, is associated with the production of earthquakes was something that activists began to flag very early on in our shale oil boom. It is something that scientists have followed up with a variety of kinds of research to say that in many respects, not only do we have what we initially found, which was correlation, tight correlation in space and time, but in fact now we increasingly have mechanisms for how forces travel under the earth to give rise to earthquakes. So an increasing body of scientific evidence, quibbly around the edges, but increasingly robust in body, indicates that we have that, that activities related to our energy boom are indeed giving rise to these earthquakes. And yet, our individual state regulatory bodies, which is how we control energy development in this country, state by state, have been remarkably reticent and remarkably divergent in their understandings or acknowledgement of this science. This is really interesting to me. It's interesting to me because I'm an American voter and taxpayer and user of energy. And it's also interesting to me because I'm a historian. Now, usually I deal in the 19th century where people are dead. But I've also done some work on the history of, of earthquakes. And I am really interested in the ways in which this gives us a chance to look at the creation of a new earthquake science. This is a global story. This is a story that has consequences in China, where there are many shale resources identified, and in many parts of the world, earthquakes were a major reason for a countrywide ban on hydraulic fracturing in England. It's now being lifted and debated. I decided to look as at least a starting place for one particular piece of this story, and that is in the Fayetteville Shale of north central Arkansas, and just, which actually does not cover the city of Fayetteville, if you're familiar with that city, right? But it is in north central Arkansas. Look there because I'm from there. They'll put me up when I go research. Also look there because of the very interesting earthquake history of this part of the world. That in 2004, as in many places in North America, this new industry went in there. 2009, the injection wells to take care of the wastewater, which I'll talk more about in just a second, also went in. Immediately thereafter, citizens in North Central Arkansas started to feel the earth shake not in any kind of earthquake that would bother a Californian at all. Little bitty earthquakes. But they were very disturbed by it. They raised heck. They raised all kinds of ruckus. And the Oil and Gas Commission, which is the regulatory body of Arkansas, said, we don't know that you're right. We don't know that what you're saying, that the injection wells are causing these earthquakes, we're not sure that that's really a connection. 
but better safe than sorry. We're going to put a moratorium on those injection wells. And the earthquakes have very largely turned off. So this is an interesting case study of a place in which citizens have engaged in arguments that are about science with regulators and had an effect that we can now look at as one of the first examples of citizens of a, of a region actively turning on and turning off seismicity by choice. So I went down to the Arkansas Geological Survey. They'd helped me before and said, hey, I want to know about the science and technology and the rocks that give us hydraulic fracturing and give us, we think, these earthquakes. And Scott Ausbrooks, the assistant director, said, sure, hop in the truck. So we started out from Little Rock, Arkansas, center of the state. We drove north. And as we drove, we drove back in time. Because, as many of y'all with a geology background in this room know, there's an uplift so that layers of earth that are deep, deep underground in the center of the state come gradually to the surface the further north you go. So we drove north and we drove back in time. We started going by, uh, we went drove north from Little Rock through the towns of Guy and Greenbrier. If you blink, you would miss both of them together. This is the little town of Guy, economically depressed, pretty poor farmland, beautiful countryside, kind of scrawny cows. Um, you can see evidence of hydraulic fracturing everywhere you go in the very small uh, well pads that are what's done after the active drill site, but also in the road widening that is taking place throughout this region to repair the roads uh, that are damaged by the giant 18-wheelers. You also see evidence of the disputes, both legal and civic, about the so-called frack quakes. But I didn't want to spend time there. I wanted to go see the rocks. I needed to understand that science. So we kept driving. We drove and drove. And we came to the outcrop here along an Arkansas State Highway where the Fayetteville Shale comes to the surface, where eons and eons of plankton have been decomposed and buried, baked by pressure, heat, and time into thick organic material. This is what we plumb. This is what we mine to get our contemporary energy boom. Through astounding uh, engineering, we send wells deep a mile and more into the ground, and then using the same computer guidance that we use for missile systems, turn them under the ground, pointing them precisely where we want to go. And then with both explosive force and precise engineering in a multi-stage process, we burst out slick water and chemicals and a lot of water in exact directionality to fracture the shale that we're going through, break open micro pores in it, and then suck that back out, harvesting that oil and that gas. It is an incredible technological achievement, a testament to American engineering and American ingenuity. It is also, as near as I can tell, magic. We are getting from solid rock, oil, and gas. I brought a piece of that shale to say, look, you cannot fool me. This is solid. If I dropped it on my foot, it would hurt. And out of this, we get oil and gas. We also get massive amounts of liquid. We put liquid in to create the hydraulic fracture. We also pull out um, a lot of wastewater because we, uh, the products of decay that create the shale also create a lot of radioactive isotopes and other kinds of nastiness that we pull out in so-called produced water, both in conventional oil and gas and through fracking. So we drove further. We drove to one of the most beautiful places it's ever been my pleasure to see, the Buffalo River, the longest free-flowing undammed river in the United States, protected by federal statute. And along the Buffalo River, there is this gorgeous outcrop of Arbuckle limestone, porous rock. And it is this rock and formations like it elsewhere in the country that will absorb a lot of liquid. And into this, we basically poke straws. <laughs> so this is a complicated diagram that basically is a straw deep, deep, deep into the earth with a lot of uh, concrete insulation around it into which we dump astounding amounts of wastewater. And the management of water as much as the management of oil and gas is what marks hydraulic fracturing as an industry. It is really an industry about the production and movement of water. So we drove further. Coming to the granitic pluton, that is the belly of ancient volcanoes in southeast Missouri, 
And this is the bedrock. This is what shakes when earthquakes strike the central US. And this is the earthquakes have been the subject of an increasing and increasingly precise and widespread set of scientific investigations demonstrating mechanism, demonstrating um, the sort of reproducibility and the regional variance in what's happening with earthquakes in mid-continent. Actually, I'm not going to discuss this one. What is striking in the midst of this scientific production is also the, both the diversity of regulatory response and the pushback right, from our energy companies, that is, that we all use and that we're involved in, saying, no, this is not either not the case or now, sure, there are earthquakes that are associated, but that's, it's, it's associated with water. That's not us, not fracking, that does this. And as I thought about this contradiction, I realized that the answers I needed to understand were not about the rocks, they were not about the science, they were not about the engineering, as crucial, as foundational as all those were. But it was about that first stretch of highway. It was about the people. Why is it that people, voters, citizens, taxpayers, parents, church members, Americans, in some regions listen to what science is saying, in other regions deny it, and this is true, of course, not only about earthquakes, but about our climate science. And I realized that my understanding had to be to bring to bear not only understanding the science and the technology, but understanding what choices we make based on the evidence not only of our, of our scientific regimes, but on the history we bring with us. Thank you. <laughs>